Welcome back to our next episode of What's Up Prof. Good day, Walter. Good day. I see we've swapped shirts today. Yes. Uh, I wanted to show the people I also have shirts like you have. <laughs> and I wanted to show them I have shirts like you. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Let's open up with a word of prayer. I'll open up and you can close. Excellent. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come back together again. We ask that you lead the way with your Holy Spirit and guide us in everything that we learn. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So we've been discussing quite a, uh, um, a lot about the second coming, the signs and all of this. There's some um, confusion, I think, about some of it. There's some fear that people have. What do you have to, have to do? Um, can I be saved? Will I be ready? Will you maybe discuss and teach us a little bit more what the Bible teaches on where are we heading in this stage? You know, basically, it always comes down to the character of God. If you have a wrong concept of the character of God, then fear will always be a factor. In the Middle Ages, fear was the driving force of the religious system. And then the Protestant Reformation came and took it to the other extreme. And then we have to sort of get back to a, a median path. But the character of God is absolutely critical. How do you see God? Do you see God as this hard taskmaster? Or do you see God as a loving, kind, compassionate, comforting God. And how far do you go along that? I always like to quote Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, where Moses asked that he should see God. And God said, if you see my face, then you will not survive. It's like the brilliance of the sun to the times 10. So... It reads there, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Those are the attributes of God. And then this promise, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So here you have this beautiful balance between graciousness and kindness and compassion and justice. Yes. The two work together. You, you cannot divorce the one from the other. If you put too much emphasis on the justice, mm. then you have a harsh taskmaster that cannot wait to chop your head off for whatever your indiscretions are. Yes. But if you mingle the two, and justice and mercy kissed each other at the cross, they demonstrated God's justice, but they also gen absolutely demonstrated His mercy and His forgiveness. And then there's interesting uh, addition visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Now, that confuses many people. Yes. What does that mean? I mean, God very clearly in his word says that the iniquity of the fathers may not be transferred to the children and the other way around is also taboo. Yes. So what does it mean when he says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation? Now, as a scientist, uh, I, I studied genetics, of course. And then a relatively recent development in genetics is the science of epigenetics. And this shows that inherited tendencies, mm. and not just the genetic blueprint of what you are, 
are also transferred from one generation to another. So not just the hardcore DNA, but also the life experience and the attitudes are transferred via the epigenes. Yes. Uh, to make it simple, we don't want to go into a science lecture now. I have some lectures on it in the genetics lecture. People can look at those if they want to. But uh, to put it simply, your genes are your hardware and your epigenetics is the software. And the two work together. And when th there is a transfer of genes to the next generation, it's not only the hardware, but the software that is transferred as well. So if you have inherited tendencies, whatever they may be, they can be dietary, they can be mood. If you are a very angry person with these, these anger hormones in your body all the time, yes. then your genetic presupposition is likely to be transferred to the next generation. And they say that it takes about three or four generations to get rid of this epigenetic transfer. So this is a beautiful scientific statement, actually. So he's not saying that he's going to punish the next generation. He's saying that the inherited tendencies will be perpetuated. And if, you, if, you if your family is struggling with one particular thing, then that is something that you must guard against. Let's say it's anger. Yeah. Then the next generation must, must work harder at that particular point. But it could be a dietary thing that leads to cancer. Yeah. That means if you have a propensity in the family, let's say towards breast cancer, that you will have to take dietary, um, well, uh, behavioral strategies to counteract it more so than those that don't have the, yes. those tendencies. So that's what he's basically saying. He's saying, I'm a merciful God. I'm a kind God. I'm a forgiving God. But that doesn't mean that I'm not a God of justice. I'm a God of justice as well. And the two have to be, be in harmony. So if you have transgressions, if you have sinned, then come to me and let's reason together and I'll forgive you and I'll embrace you and I'll help you and then we'll, we'll work at it and bring you back into harmony with God's requirements. That's what the, what the verse means. So it's very beautiful. So yeah. people that are afraid overemphasize one of the attributes of God and people that are lackadaisical overemphasize the other attribute of God, mm. but you have to have them both. both. That's in What's beautiful for me here is that you actually used Old Testament scripture to show the beauty of God, where a lot of people will say that God of the Old Testament is this wrathful tyrant. Yes. And the New Testament God is a loving one. But here you just showed us that it's... They're both there. Yes. Now, if you take the New Testament... Uh, God portrayal in, in Jesus Christ, where this is God manifest in the flesh. How did he demonstrate his justice? By paying the price. The wages of sin is death. death. And God's justice demanded the death sentence. And in Christ, Everybody can be saved because corporately all of humanity was in Christ when he died on that cross because he being God mm. had all of humanity in him. That's why only God could have paid that price Correct. and nobody else. Yes, that is beautiful. So can you take us a little bit further? Because, yes, because this, uh, what you've been discussing also in the previous ones is Matthew 24 and we've been in Focusing a lot on that. Yes. But that's not the only part, portions in the Bible that... No. So we've been focusing a lot on Matthew 24 and we've, we've gone through many of those issues. But you know, there's also a Matthew 22 and uh, there's a Matthew 25. And for those people that have fears about if Christ should return, am I ready? Mm. There's this beautiful parable that Jesus gives in Matthew 22 on the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. 
So here is the, the marriage ceremony. And uh, it tells the story about the invitation that goes out to everyone to come to this great event. Now remember in the olden days, the marriage took place and that wasn't the actual ceremony where the husband and the wife came together, right? Where the two parties came together. That's something that took place before. So this is this invitation. And then finally, he comes to the point where he says to his servants, the wedding is ready, and, but they that were bidden were not worthy, because many refused to come. I'm busy with this, I'm busy with that. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. Now, you have this, this picture everywhere in the Bible. God sends out a blanket invitation. But not everybody is in tune with God. So some come to the invitation for the bread and the fishes, the loaves and the fishes. Yeah. Some come for whatever reason. Uh, some come out of curiosity. Yeah. Some come to say, I was there. I was there, yeah. But how serious are you about mm. this invitation? And, and the invitation is not only to the elite. The elite have the invitation, but it goes to the highways and byways. And so the servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. You know, you have the, the wheat and the tares. Yes. So people always expect, you know, you're going to go to church and you're going to find these absolutely marvelous, perfect people in the church. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasant surprise, right? Yeah. When you find out, well, I'm being a little bit facetious there. Not so pleasant surprise yeah, you when find you find that it's not so. It's not so. Even if you look at your own character, you say, phew, okay, so there's other people like me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so the servants went out into the highway and they gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, the wheat and the tares growing together. And the wedding was furnished with guests. That's a beautiful explanation of the church. Yeah, they're all sitting. And, uh, you know, you might have an attribute that irritates person A and... Uh, Person B doesn't have a problem with that attitude. Yes. So we're going, it's like a family. Yes. You rub up against each other. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. This is a very important part of scripture. And he said unto him, and I like this, friend. Yes. This, is, this is how God is. So he knew this man. Because he called him a friend. And when you eat with someone, yeah. you're a friend, right? So this is the person that was in the church, but he didn't have a wedding garment on. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thee in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. It's interesting that it says outer darkness. Yes. So you have those that are in a relationship and those that aren't, right? And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now that has nothing to do with selection. Mm -hmm. It has to do with your choice. Now, why was this friend in trouble? Because he didn't because have the garment. With what garment did he have on? He, he was dressed, obviously. Yes. He wasn't naked. So what garment did he have on? He had the garment of his own righteousness. Mm -hmm. And this is where people make a mistake. And this was the beauty of the Reformation. The Reformation put into center stage the righteousness of Christ. Yes. Justification by faith. Justification by faith is such an astoundingly beautiful doctrine. There is nothing as powerful as justification by faith. It means I do not 
get saved because of my own righteousness. I get saved because of His mm. beautiful righteousness, His seamless robe of righteousness. Uh, the symbolism in the Bible is just unbelievable. Mm. Man, his, his robe was seamless. Yes. It, was, it was woven in a heavenly loom. <laughs> So here's this, this seamless robe of righteousness with not one spot or one wrinkle in it. Yes. And it covers you. But if you come there with your own righteousness, then you have no chance. You will end up outside because your own righteousness will not stand up to the scrutiny of God in terms of justice, mm. in terms of His broken law. Yes. So never ever can I say I am saved by my good works mm. or because I'm a wonderful person or because I haven't done this or I haven't done that. The wages of sin is death. Yes. There is nobody that hasn't sinned, mm. no matter how sweet they are. There's nobody that hasn't sinned. Yes. Doesn't the Bible say so? Yep. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he that says he's without sin is a liar. So what does it take to get hold of that robe? You have to come to God. What shall we do to be saved? The first word out of Peter's mouth was repent. Yes. Right? In other words, turn around. Say, okay, I acknowledge I have this problem. And now I'm stripped of my importance and my robe. I'm naked. So cover me with your righteousness. And this is an imputed righteousness. It is an alien righteousness. It's not a righteousness that is my own. It is a righteousness that is His. And it is a juridical proclamation. In other words, it is a legal proclamation. You are declared righteous. In His righteousness, not your own. So His righteousness covers you. So the thief on the cross, he could only qualify for this. Yes. Then, of course, you have this nice theological term. After that comes imparted righteousness. And that is a process yes. where through trial and error and stumbling, and striving to enter into the narrow gate. God imparts His character elements to you. So if you were a mean, miserly person, you become kinder and less miserly, yeah. and it's a growth process. So how afraid do I have to be of God if I understand His character? If I know that I'm in the wrong, do I have to say to him, I need another five weeks in order to get this thing sorted? Mm. Or do I have to break and say, I'm guilty? I was wrong? Forgive me? Help me to be nicer? Help me to be kinder? And God gives you his righteousness. Yes. From that moment, you are perfect through his justification. Through his justification. That should take away fear. Yes. Your, your picture of God, if your picture of God is one false step and you go to hell. Mm. Uh, Calvinism and Methodism, for example. Wesley said, the difference between the approaches is your view of God. Mm. Do you see God as the spirit all-powerful ruler who will have his will be done no matter what? Or do you see God as this kind, merciful, loving Father? And he uses the Lord's Prayer and he says, it says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Or do you see God as our ruler who is in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But all right, he is a powerful ruler. Yes. 
But what is your concept of God? And if we can get that right, then a lot of fear should just disappear. Correct. Now, we spoke about Matthew 24 quite a lot. And uh, we came to some very interesting, perhaps one or two things. Mm. Didn't you say some people had a problem with the uh, abomination of desolation, right? Yes, I've got, there was some comments on that. And yeah. think, clear it up a little bit more. Yeah, let's just have a look here. I have some interesting stuff here. In Matthew 24, you have all the signs of the end. Now, yes. we've, we've dealt with that uh, quite considerably. In Matthew 24, from verse 15, remember that it said, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel, Daniel. the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. And we explained that this, if you take the parallel text in, in Luke, that this represented the Roman armies in the holy place. Now, what does the holy place mean? Did it mean the first compartment of the sanctuary, which was the holy place? Mm -hmm. Or, well, that's not where the Roman army stood, right? Correct. According to Luke. Yes. But for a number of furlongs outside the city was also regarded the holy, holy place. place yes. So when you see the armies surrounding and standing in this holy place, with their pagan standard coming to destroy Jerusalem, then you must flee. Now, when you continue this, it says then you must get out of the cities. And we spoke about no, uh, Titus's it. second siege and Cestius's first siege and what happened. Now, this is also, of course, a, a, a story about the end. Mm -hmm. And it says in verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, sake, those days shall be shortened. And then it warns about the false comings of Christ and says, if you hear Christ is here or yeah. there, we spoke about those issues. And then he says, no, the coming of Christ will be universally visible, like lightning, for yes. example. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. But it will also be universally audible. Yes. It will be universally visible. visible. And uh, it's fascinating. And then this fascinating verse in the King James Version. Matthew 24 verse 28. Wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now, you know, that doesn't make really much sense when you look at it like that. Yes, because eagles don't gather around carcasses. Correct, correct. So the modern translations actually, shall we say, in adverted commas, mm. try to correct it. And if you take the NIV, for example, it says, wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. So they put vultures in the place of eagles. Yes. Now, is the King James wrong there? Or did, did the translators of the modern versions perhaps miss something? What were we talking about before? Weren't we talking about the Roman army surrounding yes. Jerusalem? this uh, pagan standard standing in the holy place. In other words, the dictates of paganism being enforced upon God's people, yes. etc. And if you go to this v word, eagles, it's etos. And you find it in, uh, uh, if you go to the concordances. And Thayer has an interesting one. It says, an eagle. Yeah. But then he, he qualifies it because it's complicated. And he says, since eagles do not usually go in quest of carrion, this may refer to a vulture that resembles an eagle. He tries to qualify it. Yeah, I, I've seldom seen a vulture that, <laughs> that resembles an eagle, except perhaps in flight. You can say, wow, is that yeah. now an eagle or is it a vulture? But then he has a second example and he says to an eagle as a standard for Roman, Roman military. military 
And I believe that that is what the real issue is. So the eagle was the standard of the Roman military. Uh, if you go to Wesley's comment, it says in Matthew tw about Matthew 24, 28, Wesley wrote the following. For wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So he obviously used the received text, right? Uh, the King James there. Our Lord gives this as a further reason why they should not hearken to any pretended deliverer. So there's a false religion yes. and a true religion. It links on to the verses, if you hear Jesus is there, don't go out. Correct. As if he had said, expect not any deliverer of the Jewish nation, for it is devoted to destruction. It is already before God a dead carcass, which the Roman eagles will soon devour. So he understood it that way. He understood that this abomination of desolation was the Roman standard. And the standard of the Romans was the eagle. Now, if you go to the book of Revelation, then you will find that there will be a second beast that will do the dictates of the first beast. In other words, a second one that does the dictates of, of Rome. And we studied that in Two Beasts Become Friends. And it is Protestant United States of America. What is their symbol? The eagle. Just an interesting <laughs> point. So, yes, so that was an issue. And then immediately after the tribulation of that time, referring to the Middle Ages, you will have the other signs of the coming of the law. And then in verse 32 he says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. And the fig tree was... Uh, an example of the Jewish nation, right, of, yes. of, of Israel. But when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that the summer is nigh. So likewise, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. So we discussed all of those verses and uh, uh, we discussed the signs of the times and that's what we've been focusing on. Yes. And I think we should move on mm -hmm. to Matthew chapter 25. And Matthew 25 starts with the parable of the virgins. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. I mean, this is such a, a famous parable. Yes. And it's strange that it comes immediately after Matthew 24. Now, we've already looked at Matthew 22 and the robe of righteousness. Now, what preparations did these virgins have to make? And I know that Matthew 25, the parable of the virgins, refers particularly to the time of the close of the 2,300 day prophecy. And, uh, but it, it, is a, it is actually also a timeless prophecy. Yes. Because in every stage of human history, God's people had sleeping virgins. Yeah. And it'll be no different at the end. So even though there was a very particular uh, application at one stage, there will be a application at the end. Yes. Now, I think we should discuss Matthew 25 because this is the preparation for God's people. And seeing that people want to know, you know, what must we do in the time that we are living in? Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Mm. You know, God is a God also of numbers and numerology. Yes. Uh, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So there were ten virgins. That means they had not defiled themselves, right? Yes. They had not defiled themselves with the ways of the world. 
they hadn't drunk in the wine of Babylon. They were, they were in tune with God. Yes. They were virgins. Now, something else comes to mind, this number 10. Mm. Where do we find the number 10? The Ten Commandments. What are the attributes of God's last church? They will keep the Ten Commandments. They will keep the commandments of God, yeah. right? So here are 10 virgins. And they took their lamps. Now, what is, the, what is the lamp? Thy word is a lamp unto my, my feet. feet. Correct. So they, they had the word. And they went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now, there's another little parable uh, in, in Luke. We read about the parable of the lost coins. Yes. And there were also 10 yes. of them. And... One of them was lost, and it's interesting, it says there, uh, what woman having ten pieces of silver, now it's always interesting to look at these parables because a woman in the Bible is a church, is a church right? Having ten pieces of silver, in other words, ten precious something. Yes. If she lose one, yeah. <laughs> could you lose a commandment? Uh, yeah. You could, eh? Does not light a candle. So, yeah. what does that mean? Search the scriptures. Yes. Right? Yes. You've got to search the scriptures because the candle is the light and the light is the word. So, if you've lost something, go find it in the word. Yes. That's what it means. And then sweep the house. <laughs> What's the house? Church. It's the church. So, if a church has lost something of value that comes from the Word of God, mm -hmm. then she has to search the Scriptures to find it. And if she finds it, well, in order to find it, you have to first sweep the house, right? Yes. So, she sweeps the house Beautiful. and seek diligently till she finds it. Yes. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors. What does that mean? The other churches. You will do some evangelism, yeah, evangelism. right? Evangelism. Okay. Other churches, other people. So, isn't it surprising that uh, we have discovered that the law of God is binding, right? Mm. The Ten Commandments, the Ten Precepts are precious. And the commission is, go ye into all the world and preach the yeah. gospel. Baptizing and teaching. In other words... Talk about the precepts. Call the friends and the neighbors. Are they all going to be excited? No, unfortunately not. No. Saying, rejoice with me. Yes. For I have found the peace which I had lost. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. The wages of sin is death. We spoke about that. Sin, by definition, is what? Transgression of the law. Transgression of the law. That's what John writes, right? Yes. In his epistles. So, here you have the full package. So, now, with this in mind, and we know what the lamps are, let's read on with uh, the virgins. So, they took their lamps, and as you said, Psalms 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it says then in verse 2, And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Now these are all in the church, yeah. right? They're all virgins. They that were foolish took their lamps. Their Bibles. They had the word of God. Yes. And they took no oil with them. Oil is a symbol of? The Holy Spirit. Why don't you give us Bible study? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just answering your questions. No, no, no. I think you should start sitting here and I'll sit over there. <laughs> <laughs> but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So what does that mean? No, there you have to help me now. <laughs> <laughs> You're just pulling a fast one. Uh, we are vessels, says the Bible, either for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. 
and it's up to God to determine what this vessel is going to do. So how do I get oil into this vessel? If I'm the vessel, I have to internalize the oil, right? Correct. That means I must allow the Holy Spirit to make the truth part of my being. Yes. The, it says they, they took their lamps and took no oil. So that part is, you take the word. They had the word, but they hadn't internalized it. Internalized it. So the vessel couldn't internalize the word because it didn't let the Holy Spirit do the working. Correct. So, you know, I can know everything about this Bible. My father-in-law, he was such a brilliant man. And... If anybody knows about my testimony, he was an occultist. Mm. And he studied this Bible day and night. Day and night. He was absolutely involved in every verse, but he interpreted everything from mm. an esoteric uh, direction. He had no idea about the plan of salvation. In fact, it was totally turned upside yeah. down. And only towards the end of his life did something click. And I really hope I will see him again one day. I'd love to talk to him. So five were, were wise and five were foolish. And those that didn't internalize the word make it part of themselves. Not just pay lip service to it, but actually live it out. And uh, allow this vessel to be changed. You know, if you take Proverbs 25, verse 4, it says, Take away the dross from the silver, mm. and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Wow. Isn't that also beautiful? beautiful? So you're taking away this dross, that which is wrong in your life, your, your anger. We have, we have these inherited tendencies. Mm. Now, God is going to look at you and say, oh, you have inherited tendencies. I'm going to chop you right off, right? Then I wouldn't be sitting here. No, he's going to work with you. And if you have a particular tendency, which might be abrasive, and uh, you know, some people may say, whoa, this person has no chance whatsoever. Yes. God takes those circumstances into account. He takes your inherited tendencies into account. Uh, it is not how often you fall, it's how often you get yeah. up mm -hmm. that makes the difference. So yes, I have a lot of dross inside of me. And uh, many people preach perfectionism. Mm. Perfectionism is a striving to do what is right. And only within my sphere, within the, my capacity, I have to do what is right. But always there is this covering of God, mm. His righteousness, and He's working in my heart. So, you know, a person can be very fiery. You're quite a fiery young man. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my like, good tendencies and then I've got um, some breaks as well. Yeah. My better half is the breaks. Your better half are the is the breaks? <laughs> well, it's amazing, you know. Luther, he also had some breaks in his relationships. Melanchthon were, were his breaks, yeah. theologically speaking. And his wife had such beautiful <laughs> <laughs> attributes, his kete. I love the story about Martin Luther and his kete. Yeah, the story when he was depressed and he sat in the chair. Do you know that story? I, I can recall it, but you can tell it to us. That... And she put on black clothes and <laughs> black veil and a hat. And I don't know for how long. I think it was two weeks or something. She walked around the house with a black veil <laughs> and black clothes until he finally noticed in his depression. And he said to her, what's this nonsense of <laughs> you walking around with black? Who died? And she says, I'm in mourning. Yeah. Well, who died? And uh, she said, God died. <laughs> and he said, rubbish, God <laughs> died. <laughs> and then she said, but you act like he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she gave him an object lesson. So God has his ways of dealing with our inherited tendencies. Yeah.
And uh, I'd just like to say something. When you have, we've, you've been mentioning now the temper, but maybe. If you are asking God to help me with my temper situation, He's not going to take it away. He's going to, you're going to probably get into more situations where that temper is tested. And that's where He comes in. He's then there to help you to go. To work on it, and and you have to you have to work on it. You have to say, I don't want this, Lord. And then when it pops up, does that mean the guillotines come down and you're lost? No, no then you go when... through it again and again and again. And and this is called sanctification. It's a process. So God doesn't leave you alone. Yeah. Uh, at every stage, He's like a father. Uh, my son now has a, a baby who's a toddler. He's one year old and he's actually starting to walk. And the great excitement when he takes three little steps, you know, yes. three pathetic little steps. That's how God is. Exactly. Exactly. And so as you grow, you will, of course, have better steps. And it starts immediately. Yes. It's not that you have, like you said earlier, you have to have four years, two weeks, five weeks, immediately when you ask God. You're in that relationship from the moment you say, I want it. Yes. And I don't want these tendencies. I mean, if you are abrasive, now fortunately I've never been abrasive in my entire life. I'm perfect, <laughs> right? Uh, if you see that tear running down someone you really care for, yeah. cheek, and you think to yourself, ah, why am I such an idiot? Yeah. <laughs> and then you ask God to help you with it. And, you know, uh, that's how it works. Okay, now let's go to verse 5. While the bridegroom tarried, mm. where is he, you know? Mm. What happened? They all slumbered and slept. That is very strange. They all slumbered and slept. In other words, nobody was really ready mm. for the announcement. And at midnight, the darkest hour of world's history, there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and they went, what? What's going on? Where? where why? Is, when is he coming? You know, yeah. etc. So something must wake them up hmm. and say, you know what, time, the Lord's coming. And they run backwards and forwards through the word of God. They all trimmed their lamps. They all went to the word yes. to see what is going on. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us your oil for our lamps are gone out. Hmm. That's a very sad statement. Very sad. That's a very sad statement. Now, the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. Are they being selfish? No. You sure? I think they just state. You, you cannot impart to others what is, not, what is part of you. Yeah. It's something that should have happened in their lives. They should have studied the word. They should have internalized the truths. And their lives should have been, or at least an attempt should have been made to come into harmony with God's word and to internalize that truth. Now, what if you, like me, I was an atheist. What if... Just before the close of probation, somebody tells me something about the Word of God. Mm. And I say, wow, I was wrong all my life. And I don't have mm -hmm. yeah. large, you know, huge amounts of time to go and do this. If I honestly say, whoa, I was wrong. Lord, forgive me. Will I be rejected? No. No, so what does it mean? Yeah, when because it's, it also links on again to the thief on the cross. That's right. He, could, he didn't have time to go and trim his lamp. He didn't have time, no. This, But he the, made a decision. Yes. I want to be like that, right? Now, so but what you mentioned these? earlier, you must realize who 
who's the virgins. Correct. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why had their lamps gone out? Yes. The problem with them is that they had so conditioned themselves in this notion that this wasn't going to happen in their lifetime, number one, and they had consistently not internalized what the Holy Spirit had taught them. In other words, they never incorporated it into their life. So they have had, because they were virgins, all of this time to allow God to remove the dross. But they were just paying lip service to the, to the word. They were saying, well, this is not important for me now, and this is not important for me whenever. Yes. And so it was too late for them because they had become so conditioned in rejecting the little prods of the Holy Spirit into a particular direction. Let's say God convicts you in the word that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And you co you've had these opportunities and consistently you have resisted them. Then you run out of oil. Yes. Because the Holy Spirit will say, well, I told you, but you won't listen. Whereas a man who comes in from atheism is the biggest drunkard that you've ever seen under the planet and suddenly realize, whoa, I was wrong and asks for forgiveness. He hasn't been conditioned like that. Mm -hmm. And the time of ignorance God winks at and he can actually take the place of a virgin that's quite astounding, it's isn't very, it? Yeah. So those are very important points. The wise answered, not so. Can't give you the oil. The foolish said to the wise, give us your oil, for our lamps have gone out. The wise said, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Go and buy. That's interesting. Yes. Where do you buy? What store do you go to? What about um, Simon Magus? Yes, Simon Magus wanted the shortcut. He wanted the power without the conversion. He said, give it to me, I'll buy it. Your money perish with you, right? <laughs> but where can you buy? Revelation chapter 3. And uh, this is the counsel to the Laodicean church. This is the last church. Mm. I counsel thee to buy from me gold tried in the fire. Now that's, that's amazing. That there may be rich and a white raiment, there you have that robe of righteousness, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So you are counseled to buy gold, Gold is character. Mm. And where do you go and buy it? Tried in the fire. Right. Mm. In other words, through the fire of affliction. Is there time for the virgins to achieve that? No, there's no time. There's no time. Now what about that uh, atheist who comes in at the last minute? Does he have time? No. So, how do you work this? God looks at the intention and the resolve, yes. mm -hmm. and God being all-knowing knows this person, like the thief on the cross, mm -hmm. is serious. And given the opportunity, he would learn the lessons. Yes. And God covers him with his righteousness. But the one that has had the opportunity and consistently rejected it, has proven already that he is not open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And while they went to buy, they tried to get what they neglected to do. Remember, these are people in the church. We're yes. talking about them now. The bridegroom came. And they that were ready went with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Mm. That's a very sad statement. So there was a close of probation for those virgins. Yes. They couldn't get in. 
Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Mm. That must be the worst words that anybody can hear. Yes. He's talking to the church here. So, watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So, what is our duty as Christians now? As people in the church. Uh, the virgins. They're not defiled with the wine of Babylon. There are ten of them. They have the whole thing together. They have the whole word of God. Nice. They have all ten coins in, coins in their coffer. And five of them are in tune with what they know, and five of them are not. And they've had an opportunity. So what is our task now in the light of this? We have to reassess. We have to reassess our lives. We have to say, is Christ really coming soon? You know, people always think, I can put it off, I can put it off. So we have to be in a state of readiness. So just like someone who comes in from the outside, I can do the same, even if I'm in the church. Mm. I can say, Lord, I have been foolish. I have resisted the proddings of your Holy Spirit. Mm. I pray that you will forgive me and bring me into harmony with your word. And God will do it. Yes. But if you have trained your mind to resist, then you are in trouble. So my suggestion would be that everybody takes a good look at their relationship with God, takes a good look at the lamp, mm. and says, Lord, I, I have a lot to learn. And please forgive me, and let's start again. Would God reject such a person? No. no. Never. 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 Nobody who has ever come to him will he turn away when there is true repentance in the heart. I think in actual fact, there will be rejoicing in heaven. Exactly. If you do that. And you know, immediately after that story comes the story of the talents. And uh, there you have the same story. Everybody has different attributes. And how did you put them to use to further God's kingdom? Hmm. Did you say, well, I know you were a hard taskmaster, and therefore it <laughs> doesn't matter uh, to me. I don't want to be involved, so I, I hid my, my talent. Uh, in my own family circle, my mother-in-law, who was an atheist, and uh, she was always very annoyed with the Bible. And we were sitting and talking after we were we were always on the same wavelength because I was an atheist. Yeah. So I, she was a wonderful person and uh, very upright in all her things and a very intelligent professor at the university and uh, and very knowledgeable. And she got so annoyed every time later when we, when we accepted Christianity and she said, God is not fair. Because the story where he calls people to work in his vineyard yeah. and he, he makes a day's wages yes. and then he calls some later and then some at the 11th hour. Mm. And at the end of the day, he gives them the same wages, right? And she says, that is, that is so unfair. That is unrighteousness. That is, it just shows the character of God. It's disgusting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked at her and I said to her, okay, you're thinking in terms of the world. You're thinking in terms of monetary remuneration for a work done. Mm -hmm. But God is not thinking in terms of that. He's thinking of eternal life. Yes. The reward for the work in the vineyard when you are in tune with this, well, is eternal life. 
So are you, do you want a half eternal life or a quarter eternal life? Or a fraction yeah. <laughs> of eternal yeah. life? You can't. The wage is the same. Yeah. And you can't complain about it. And uh, the same here with the talents. So you have the story here where he that received two, he had gained other two. He that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with him, with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And the one who had received two talents, and uh, he said, you gave me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents. And he said, well done. Yeah. yeah. I always look at this story and I think to myself, this is, this is astounding. Do you know who I have the best rapport with in the church? Those that have very few talents. Mm. Uh, they, they act from simplicity. They're not so complicated. They're not so educated that the education has clouded their, their perspectives. They have such simple faith. The Lord said it, I believe, I believe it. it. And the Lord's going to say to them, well done, well done. And some of them have got many talents and then you have to use them for the Lord. And he'll say, well done. But you're not saved by your works, ever. Mm -mm. Never. But the other one, he hid his talent in the earth. And the Lord called him a wicked and slothful servant. So you can, you can have the truth and never use it. Or you could be afraid to use it. Now the Bible says, outside are the fearful. In other words, if you are too afraid, too afraid to ever give an opinion or speak about God's word, and thereby people are lost because of your silence. And some people are afraid of ridicule, right? Yes. And Peter was afraid of ridicule, and yes. he fell. Mm. Now, ridicule is an amazing thing, and it's probably one of the hardest ones to overcome. When I became a believer and I started teaching or lecturing on creation versus evolution I got ridiculed like you cannot believe yeah. and they said you know this man's been struck by lightning <laughs> and he's gone mad uh, some got very angry some scientists even spat in my face yeah. I mean, it's amazing how angry people get at these things. Ridicule is the hardest one yeah. to handle. It is. Yeah. So, what is your attitude, in other words, to this gospel? In verse 29, For unto everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that has not shall be taken away even that which he has. And cast ye the unprofitable servants into outer darkness. There you have again. that same sort of issue. So again, what must I do if I know this truth? What is my duty? To share it. Yes. It's not my responsibility to make sure that the other person accepts it. I must just share it. And I mustn't be afraid to say what I believe. So, do you think the people will, my colleagues, for example, my ex-colleagues at the university, do you think they will mock me if I say the Lord made this world in six days? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can be pretty sure, yes. right? 
So they, they will ridicule me for believing in a six-day creation. And they will ridicule me for believing in a short chronology, right? Yes. Uh, do I therefore have to bury my faith? No. And hide it under a bushel? And say to the Lord one day, I knew what the truth was, but I never opened my mouth. That's correct. No, if I know the truth, I have to speak. Yeah, it, it, when you, for instance, like you, we mentioned um, in a previous episode, I also wasn't an Adventist, Seventh day Adventist all my life. So when these truths and these things started coming towards us and we accepted it and we were excited, I think. If I just think back that uh, William Miller and those people that thought they had these beautiful truths coming to them now wanted to share it to everybody. And they thought that the churches will embrace this. And that, that, didn't. that the Lord is coming. The same that I embraced it. The Lord wants us to have a special time with him on his day. It hasn't changed. So I want everybody to know this beautiful thing. And you came up against a brick wall? Uh, you, and I think you will up until when the Lord actually comes in the clouds. But nevertheless, the you told your friends. So when you found that coin, that lost coin, and you'd swept your house and you went to your friends and your neighbors and you said, Hey, I've discovered my coin here. I want to share this with you. What was the result? Yeah, not the same excitement. Not the same excitement. Okay, so... But you shared it. Mm -hmm. Now, what have you said? Uh, I'm going to keep this to myself because what's the point? It wouldn't have been beneficial to anyone, right? And afterwards, when you do actually get the ridicule, it's harder to then keep on going. Yes. That's important as well. Don't stop once the ridicule comes. So the word of God is the standard. It's the standard of righteousness. When you discover a truth, then you must ask God to write it on the tablets of your heart. And you must be able to stand by it. And, you know, God is gracious. He doesn't expect blind faith. Mm -hmm. He wants you to have an informed faith. Mm -hmm. So when I started asking the question, I'm overwhelmed because all of my scientific education tells me that this is contrary to everything that I stand for and believe. I'm not going to be able to just switch without the necessary information to base my decision on. He was gracious and he gave it to me. I went all over the world and I discovered all of these amazing examples of a totally different worldview on creation and geology. Mm. And I'm not going to give that lecture now. But then we come to the final judgment in Matthew 25. Mm. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory. What is His glory? It's His character. It's His character that shines forth. This merciful, loving God. Everything you read in Exodus yes. comes in, in that glory he comes. And all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. So there will come a time of judgment. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. What an amazing promise. Now, what is your concept of heaven? Mine. Yeah, because if you have a concept mm -hmm. of heaven like most of the world, like I had, you know, you're going to sit on cloud nine and you're going to go and Play strum off. your harp, you're right? And oh, well, you better be light enough or else you're going to fall through that cloud. Yeah, I must admit, previously you didn't have a very clear um, picture of heaven. And one picture that actually comes to mind now is one that the movies creates for you. Uh-huh. And that will be that once you die, you meet, get 
meet your relatives and all of this. So there was a, a nice aspect to it. But that was telling you that immediately after you die. So that left out, out the part that the judgment is. And there will be a death and a resurrection. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what I found amazing is that you have a physical resurrection. You're mm -hmm. called forth from the grave and you get a glorified body. Now, what does that mean? A glorified body, the Bible says, like unto his glorified body. Now, what did Jesus do when he had a glorified body after the resurrection? He stood in the middle of the room and all the doors were closed. Mm. How did he get in there? Yeah. And yet he was physical as he said, come and touch me. Mm. Here, come and do this. To Give eat. me something to eat. Yeah. I'm a human being. I'm not a ghost. So what are the capacities of those, that body? Mm. It must be amazing. And I think we've talked about some of these things before. The eye has not seen nor ear has heard the wonders that God has prepared for them that love him. Mm. The, the city with the gold streets, transparent gold, that beautiful garden of Eden inside it, those beautiful rivers, everybody, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then in the earth made new, you will plant vineyards and you will eat of them. You will no longer be driven off your land by circumstances or pain or death. Mm. And you will discover the wonders of the universe. And just imagine true education. Yes. We are so overwhelmed with lies in this world. What is truth? You have to search for it as for a hidden treasure. Imagine if all truth is open to your investigation. Imagine if you can look at a plant and you have x-ray vision and you have all the spectrum and you can see into it and you can see past it and you, your, your vision will have all the capacities that God has given. For example, an eagle. We were speaking about eagles. Yeah. Flying up there kilometers in the air and he sees a mouth's rustling that you cannot even see standing next to it. Yes. Can you imagine having that kind of vision? Can you imagine seeing ultraviolet? Can you imagine seeing x-ray vision going right into something and studying the workings and the mechanism of everything? The capacities that you will have in an unfallen brain. You know, God is amazing because every now and then he gives us a hint. And normally it is someone that has a little bit of brain damage, like autism or uh, I don't know, what was that guy's name that knows all the encyclopedias off by heart? And it's an amazing story. And Harry has total recall. He'll, he'll read a book like this has total recall of everything like a photograph and he'll give it to you. Or somebody who has to compute a, a mathematical equation. Yeah. You know, you have these super kids. These super or, kids yeah. yeah. And they just rattle off a calculation to the umpteenth decimal point. I mean, it's just unbelievable. That's the kind of capacity you will have. Mm. So there are possibilities in your brain that we cannot even think of. And then you will be able to see all the unseen worlds and you'll have the capacity to move between the dimensions, between the seen and the unseen. It'll be an amazing world. And just think of the knowledge that you'll be able to gain. And people say, no, I don't want to go. I first want to finish my, my education here. What? <laughs> and miss out on the greatest university that exists in the entire universe? With the greatest teacher that has ever existed? Yeah. I mean, it's just unbelievable that people would want to cling to this darkness when that light and those capacities will be available to you. And everything you do will be successful. Yes. Isn't that amazing? Yes. I, I like to build, you know, and it says you will build houses mm. 
and you will not build and others inhabit them. You're not going to be <laughs> disinherited of your land. Yes. You're not going to be chucked out of your house. You don't have to put a lock on your door. And no locks, no nothing. You don't need a car even mm. because you want to be somewhere. You'll be there instantly. Take examples in the Bible. They were rowing, right? Mm. Jesus was in the boat and a miracle had taken place. The next instant they were on the shore. Yes. Okay. Philip is talking to the yes. Ethiopian. He appears in the desert, gets onto that uh, wagon, gives him a Bible study. The next instant he's in a town kilometers away. Yeah. What is that? Moving. Okay. No, no tiresome drive forever and ever. <laughs> so let's say uh, you, you need help from God and you pray, Lord, help me. And he sends an angel from heaven. <laughs> and it's going to take three weeks for him to get there. That's a little bit late, right? Yeah. Instantly, before you prayed, hmm. says the Bible, I heard, before you prayed. Sure. Imagine that kind of communication with God. Yes. Can you imagine sitting at the feet of God, looking into the face? That's what I wanted to get at also for me. Um, Moses, how was his face lit up? And he was in a cloud. And he couldn't even see God face to face. No, he was in a cloud and he was shining so that the others couldn't look at him. So he must have been like the sun, right? So he had to veil his face. Imagine looking into the unobstructed face of God and getting real information and going on state visits with God. It's just amazing. And then this is what will happen. He says, enter in. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. God wants every single one to be saved. Yes. He's not a God that's tyrannical. For I was hungered and you gave me meat. And I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked you clothed me. I was sick you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer them and say, when we saw thee hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave you the drink, when we saw thee stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee, these are all question marks. When we saw thee stranger, no, I've read that, or when we saw thee sick or in prison, when did that happen? I don't know. And the king shall answer and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. That's Christianity. Mm. An act of kindness here, a word of encouragement there. That's what, I, that's what Christianity is all about. A kind word at the right time. Or sometimes no word, just a shed tear. Mm. That's what humanity needs. And that's what we need to be. There are too many Christians in the world that are so judgmental that they always have the standard that you must meet and they have this guillotine God concept. We need to set the world straight on the character of God. How is Jesus? when he dealt with the worst of them. Wasn't he always kind? Yes. But he was also just. He yes. said, go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. And how did he... Uh, I just want to also say, he treated those people with kindness and everything. And then you can see uh, the side of his righteous, of his um, his righteous indignation. Yes. Yes. And it's also not unloving. No. But it's setting him straight for the people that should have known better. Absolutely. God never does anything that doesn't entail love. Even even the destruction of the wicked is an act of mercy. 
because they would forever be unhappy, number one, and they would forever create mm. unhappiness. And God doesn't want that. When he said, the day you eat of it, you will surely die, it is the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm. Now, God never intended anyone to have the knowledge of evil. He never wanted a mother to stand at the grave of a child. He never wanted that pain that evil brings. Mm. But now that we have a knowledge of evil, it can be an inoculant. And I would say <laughs> that the whole world needs this vaccination. <laughs> you must just go. Explain that. Not the one. This vaccination against this virus called sin mm. is an inoculant that every single person yes. needs to safeguard heaven. I'm more afraid of this thing called sin mm -hmm. in my system than I am of any virus. Any virus. In any case, it can only kill me temporarily if I am in Christ. So, let us work at internalizing God's truth while we have the opportunity. Yeah. Let us not be hoarders of God's truth. Let us, let us share it. Sometimes there will be a backlash. Jesus was crucified as mm -hmm. a consequence of sharing the word of God. But he looked into the future and he looked at the joy from an eternity aspect. And we should have the same. We should be like Jesus. We should be able to look past the attributes in the character of others that cause pain. Yes. So, you know, if you see someone with five nose rings, 50 cheek rings, tattoos all over, What's your attitude going to be? Are you going to say, <laughs> look at that? Mm. Or are you going to say, that person is giving a cry for help? And if you see it like that, and you treat them with kindness, then that is doing it unto others. As you would like. As you would have done it to him. Mm -hmm. And God sees that. And uh, I had a man ask me once, he was tattooed from top to bottom. And he asked me, uh, so, am I now out of the equation? Because I have all of these twos, tattoos. And I said to him, you know, some people carry the scars of this world on the inside. And some people carry the scars of this world on the outside. What's the difference? Mm. That's beautiful. What happens is, what is your relationship with God? Yes. And that is my encouragement to the viewers. When we're talking about all of these things and the coming of Christ, whatever you do, don't lose sight of the character of God. And don't lose sight of the fact that He is a loving Father that you can approach at any time, no matter what your circumstance or however bad the thing is that has occurred in your life. With Him there is an abundance of forgiveness. So come to, your, to the Heavenly Father, confess to Him your problem, repent and receive a spotless robe of righteousness. Amen. Will you pray for us, please? Heavenly Father, there are always two sides of a story. There is a war, but there is also a victory. There's an internal war, and with you at the helm, there can be victory. And so I pray, Lord, that you will lead your people into a relationship with you, where we do not kick against the pricks of the Holy Spirit, but where we embrace them. Help us to have oil in our vessels. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.
Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click and you will receive notifications. To watch the next one, click here. Thank you again and see you next time.